to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, Jesus gives the right to be called the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. Amen. We've got for our consideration today <clears throat> the gospel lesson from Luke chapter 13. Uh, I won't read the whole thing again here, but uh, these verses to uh, get you started. If you are uh, looking along, it's a, a little bit different translation, um, not vastly different uh, the, but we, than the one we read earlier in the service. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few going to be saved? He said to him, make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. This is God's word. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, God's ways often surprise us. Sometimes it's a happy surprise when we get the message that God has saved us entirely by his grace, as we just sang, that it's all the work of Jesus, all given to us for free. Well, who isn't pleased to get a surprise like that? In fact, you know, one of the fun things about doing mission work or evangelism is being able to share that with people who've never heard it before and see the reaction when they find that out for the first time. But sometimes God uh, may spring a surprise on us that kind of troubles us. Maybe it's not something necessarily he even reveals in his word. It's just things we observe about life. If he's God, he's in charge. This is going on, so, you know, why? Why are there hungry children? Why do selfish, materialistic people succeed in life, but not only succeed, often become fabulously wealthy. Why does he ever let the evil people win? Does that make sense? Not a surprise we were looking forward to. We have an example of God's uh, sometimes surprising M.O., Several examples of it, actually, in these words of Jesus to the man who asked him the question in Luke chapter 13. Three surprises that are lined up with uh, our salvation. We, we, we find that we're, we're surprised by salvation. Surprised by its numbers. Surprised by its methods. And surprised by its objects. When we hear a passage in the Bible like God our Savior wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And then we find in the scriptures as in today's lesson an indication that not everybody's going to make it. Well, that's a reason for some surprise, isn't it? The, the, the very comprehension of that, the, the very pondering of that truth seemed to be a matter of some surprise for the man who asked Jesus this question. Then Jesus went to the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? We don't know exactly what prompted this man's question. Uh, maybe it was just the fact that he was a Jew and the Jews were this little group, a little minority in the world, both in terms of their religion and in terms of their people as a nation. And they were the ones who had the truth of God's word. Maybe it was a result of Jesus' earlier teaching in his ministry, e even in this very chapter of Luke, where Jesus had told his own people, the Jewish people in front of him, that you too must repent or perish. We don't know exactly what prompted the man's question. It was a simple yes or no question in the way he formed it, wasn't it? But as Jesus so often does in his ministry, he takes the man's question and, and then he turns it and he, he makes it an opportunity to ponder the issue at hand more carefully. 
He said to him, make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. Don't take Jesus' response in the wrong way. He's not saying heaven is going to be an empty place. There are going to be many, many people there when you and I get there also. If we uh, understand the scenes that John paints for us in the book of Revelation, there are so many people. The population of heaven is so large that the number defies count. But a, a sober reckoning of what's going on in our world tells us that many more still will not be saved. Christians are, are, are not a majority in the world. And since Jesus came and brought salvation, well, it, it is true that we've become the biggest of all the religions. Nearly two billion people claim Jesus Christ as a savior from sin, at least, at least nominally. But at the same time, you recognize that that leaves uh, five billion people, five billion who either follow other gods or no god at all. And, and right in the church, we, we have cause for some concern. When we look at those who are on the rolls of the churches, we recognize that there are many, many who we may have our questions about. Some of them that may not uh, set foot inside of a church for years, not even at Christmas or Easter. We, we, we look at the way they live their everyday lives and they're indistinguishable in life and in what they say about what they believe from the unbelieving world around them just like everybody else. They give little or no evidence that there is a, a living faith beating inside of that heart. Many, many, Jesus says, will try to enter, but will not be able to. So, maybe we're surprised by the numbers involved with salvation. And what Jesus has to say about this may lead us to ponder it a little further, and it suggests some kind of clear applications. One of those applications might be we should get going at mission work. Uh, maybe we should have a deeper concern about our straying and wandering friends. But, you know, that's not the application that Jesus suggests. He takes that question the man asks, and he turns it back on the man himself. When he answers the man's question, he he says to him, you, you, this man who's right there in front of me, you make every effort to enter through the narrow door. Be careful about the assumptions you're making about yourself, right? It's so easy for us to take our salvation for granted. I mean, you know, we were, we were baptized and we heard the message and we, we, we believed what God had to say and we were happy to receive what what God had to say. And, well, there it is. It seems like that's all taken care of. Now I can go on in my faith to other things. I don't have to worry about the salvation part so much. There's, there's other interests that I have. I'd like to become a better person. Uh, I, I'd like to change my life. And, you know, there's a time and a place for that. I'm not denying it. But the goal of the world around you and me, the goal of the devil, is not just to bring a little misery into our lives. It's not just to uh, shake the faith a little bit. They have nothing less in mind than the destruction of the faith that we hold to get rid of our salvation altogether. That the challenge of dealing with the sinful desires that live within my own sinful heart <coughs> is such that I have to acknowledge that salvation itself can be at stake. It's not just that giving into them makes for a bad Christian witness, but these are things that gnaw and erode at the faith that's inside of us and can overturn faith altogether. When the saints go marching in, I want to be in that number, the old song sings, and it's true of all of us too but we ought to give some sober consideration to salvation's numbers, which may seem surprising to us, and not make assumptions about ourselves. It also leads us to think about how we are saved. And so, as Jesus talks about some of the surprising elements of salvation, uh, we have opportunity also to consider uh, the surprise of its methods. 
When Jesus says, make every effort to enter through the narrow door, first of all, understand by every effort, he is not talking about uh, climbing into heaven by our own power. That that narrow door in Scripture is always the door of repentance over our sins and the confidence and faith that Jesus has, in fact, entirely wiped that sin out on our behalf in his grace. That's the narrow door. That method for God saving people comes as a surprise to many people. In fact, some say, well, that's too easy. It's too easy. He's just going to do it all? Nothing for us to do? That makes no sense. It's too easy. But you, you know, it's not easy at all. In fact, in some ways, it's the hardest thing in all the world to believe that. You, you, you may remember the, the movie Bambi. Remember that from when you were a kid? There's a scene towards the end where the hunters are coming and there's a covey of uh, quail or partridge that are hiding in some brush. And as the hunters come closer and closer, uh, one of those birds uh, has more and more tension about what to do. You know, as long as those birds are quiet and they stay still and they do nothing, they're safe. But that one bird just can't stand the tension, can't stand the stress. And so finally, uh, in her panic, she flies off. And of course, then she is shot. By nature, we find it hard to believe that if we stay still and do nothing, that then we're safe, that then we're saved relying entirely upon Jesus and, and his work for us and God's grace on our behalf. In fact, that is so hard to believe that God has to work a miracle change inside of our hearts to possibly think it could even be true. That, of course, is what he does. Every human effort at trying to save ourselves, on the other hand, is going to be counterproductive. It works against that same salvation. It gets in the way if we won't just stay quiet and let God do the work and do nothing. Uh, maybe like those birds in the movie, uh, people fly off on their own routes and paths to heaven because of a sense of panic. Probably more often it comes out of some kind of inner self-righteousness, this pride that I can't be that bad. So bad that there's nothing I can contribute? So bad that I have so much to repent of? But yes, that is what God says the case is. And though we may be surprised by salvation's methods, God does all the work. Jesus assures us it's true. Are we immune to these attitudes for ourselves? Jesus confronted the people of his day with this parable. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will say, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you'll say, we ate and drank with you. You taught in our streets. But he'll reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. The parable, of course, is a picture of the last day. Uh, Jesus is the man behind the door, right? The one who shut, the, 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 the householder who shut the door. And the, uh, the people knocking at the door are in uh, the picture of the parable, those people in front of Jesus on that day. They are people who are desperate to get into heaven. That they want to find some reason in themselves why they should be let in. They want to find some connection with Jesus by which that might be the case. And so what do they reach for? They say, well, you know, we, I had a dinner with you. I attended one of your lectures. And maybe those kinds of excuses sound a little lame to us, but you know, they weren't so far out of line with much of Jewish thought in Jesus' day. Um, many of his contemporaries had this idea that they were getting in just because uh, they were descended from Abraham or because they had undergone circumcision, that that, that was enough. And uh, with that kind of thinking going around, perhaps it's not so hard to believe someone had get the idea in their heads that they think that they're a shoe in for heaven just because they happened to be in attendance when Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. And not a little bit of this spooks around the church in our own time. That, that we, we, we put our trust in the wrong kinds of things. It is to your advantage in every way to be baptized. It is to your advantage in every way to go to church every week. It is to your advantage in every way to 
belong to and attend a church where the gospel is regularly preached, right? It's these very things that God is using to create faith in your hearts and then to sustain and maintain that faith in your hearts. So those are good things. But the idea that simply showing up, that, that, that simply because these things happened without letting it change your heart, without drinking in the water of life or consuming the bread of life that they have to offer, well, that's not consistent with salvation. <laughs> there is a world of difference in God's view between that uh, poor, humble, but sincere believer who would plead before him, I am baptized. And by that mean, I have a genuine trust in all the promises of grace and the connection with Jesus and his death that baptism gives me, on the one hand. And his view of the false believer who announces, I am baptized, as though simply showing up for the right was a heroic act for which he deserves a medal. One method, one way. And though we may be surprised at it, Jesus urges us to consider how it is that salvation takes place in our lives. It would not surprise us if he should say to those of the latter kind that I just described, I don't know you or where you're from. Away from me, all you evildoers. Well, the numbers and the method maybe are kind of a sobering thought for us today. I, I hope that the last part of what he has to say regarding salvation's objects is uh, a, a happier surprise. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth. That doesn't sound like it. When you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out, people will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first and first who will be last. Again, Jesus' first century audience was no doubt surprised to hear him say that their great heroes like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the prophets were all going to get into heaven while they themselves were going to be thrown out. <laughs> Who do you mean? We're the Jews. We're God's chosen people. We are the ones who have had the deposit of grace in God's word. We need to be careful so that uh, we ourselves don't adopt the same kind of self-righteous reasons for thinking that we're getting in um, a hollow shell of a religion if we don't want to be surprised in such a way that we find ourselves on the outside looking in. But then here comes the real shocking thing. Shocking, I'm sure, to his audience at that time, but a good surprise for you and for me when he shows salvation's objects. They were used to the idea no one else could be saved, but people will come. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their place at the feast in the kingdom of God. Now, unless you are a Jewish Christian, Jesus is describing you and me. We are those people that he was seeing so many years ago from all around the world who would be grabbed by the gospel and brought to faith and brought to him. We are the ones. And perhaps you aren't so surprised to hear that, hey, I'm one of the objects of God's salvation. But we have every reason to be. Like most Lutherans, my heritage traces back to Northern Europe. And if you were to trace my family back far enough, I understand that there are probably some very unsavory characters back there who lived as parts of some rather uncivilized tribes. Uh, if my history is correct, well, then frankly, uh, any number of them made their living by raping, pillaging, and plundering. Why should the gospel ever have come to them? 
and through them to me. Why would God have set his heart here? Why should there be a place for me at the feast in the kingdom of God? Why should I be the object of such grace and salvation? And maybe you're not so Germanic as I am, but your heritage is not so different. If we trace it back, why you and me? The surprising thing about our salvation does not stop at the fact that, that God would so love us, that Jesus would so love us, that he would be willing to give himself up for the ungodly and the unkind and the ungrateful. The, the surprise is that he would set his heart on you and me, on us. That he would determine that he had to have us for himself. That he would send the gospel to, to reach our hearts to people like you and me. That he would so desire us that he would turn those hearts. and claim us as his own children. The eternal objects, the eternal objects of his affection by calling us to faith and making us his own. It is a pleasant surprise to be so surprised by salvation's objects. It's been said that we live in a jaded generation. We have been exposed to so much violence so much obscenity, so much indecency that practically nothing affects us anymore. Nothing shocks us, nothing moves us, nothing surprises us. It's all the reason, all the more reason for us to be surprised by God's salvation. And to be sure that it is so. Amen. Please stand.